So I want to give you a little test to kind of like prove you can do this. Some of you will have seen this before, in which case you are honor bound not to whisper to your neighbor the answer and prove how clever you are. All right? If anybody does that, I will see them and they will come and stand in the corner of the room for the rest of the class, just to be clear on this. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is give you a task. I want you all to carry it through and be the average of the group should be the right answer. So it's a nice little test just to prove it. So I'm going to show you a video which has six students in it. Three have got white t-shirts and three have got black t-shirts. And your task, you've seen it before, so don't whisper to anybody. Your task is to count the number of times those with white t-shirts pass the basketball. If you've seen this before, put up your hand but say nothing. Okay, right. For those of you who've seen it before, which is about a quarter of the audience, go through the same process. And you may find the explanation is different from the one you had last time. For the rest of you, you've got the task? Okay, just to make it difficult, there are two balls in play. And I had to show this eight times to a group of sociologists at Melbourne University before they got the right answer. I do not want to have to stop the video frame by frame and argue with a bunch of angry retentive idiots about what is or is not a pass ever again. <laughs> so to make it very clear, if the ball leaves the hands of somebody with a white t-shirt <coughs> and it arrives in somebody else's hands, no matter how it gets there, it's one pass. Everybody got that? Okay, start counting now. Okay, shout out the numbers. 14, 14, 12, 12, 12. Okay, 12 or less, put your hands up. 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 or more. That's not bad, the answer's 14. That's a reasonable normal distribution. Aside from people who've seen it before, anything made it difficult or easy to count? No? Anybody see anything unusual? Okay, watch it again, and this time watch the whole movie. Keep watching. Especially around now. That's what we call in the business a weak signal. If that griller had just gone mad and had killed half a dozen students and there'd been a commission of inquiry, you'd have all been held accountable. But you don't see the griller because you're counting the ball. Um, the one to actually people who will see it are economists or computer scientists. But if you didn't know it, there's a high degree of partial autism in those departments in university. <laughs> because it's a positive advantage in those fields yeah? Not to be fully, but to be partially. Like dyslexia, it's very closely linked with innovation. Which, if you didn't know it, you need to know it. Because dyslexics make unusual connections, just by the nature of the way they are. I'm partially dyslexic. I don't see why everybody, you know, write all the words that are there somewhere. Why do you worry about the order? Right? I mean, it's just ridiculous, really. And why can't you see that A connects to G? Why do you want me to explain B, C, and D in the process? Yeah? We're now saying synesthesiacs see the world in a different way. Now, three basic facts about the human brain which that video points out. Firstly, you only ever scan about 3 to 5% of what's in front of you. If you're Chinese, it goes up to 10%. It looks like pictorial languages have produced a different evolutionary demand on the brain to non-pictorial languages. We also see a difference between context and object focus. People from pictorial languages will pay more attention to context, and you can see the reason for that. If you don't understand the context of the symbol, you can't get there. The way you then make decisions, so a radiologist in Harvard, let's go back to the original research on this, you know, scans an x-ray, and they scan maybe 3 to 4% of it. That's all they take in. And that's when they're really concentrated. They then have 40 to 50,000 patterns associated with their training and experience as a radiologist on their long-term memory. And the most frequently used patterns are nearer the surface of the brain, so they get activated first. And having scanned 3 to 4% of the x-ray, they do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. And that's how we all make decisions. We satisfy, we don't optimize. And this explains pattern entrainment and all sorts of things. If I had half of you and shown you nature pictures before you saw the that, you'd have seen the gorilla. If I'd taken the other half into counting exercises, 
Nobody would have seen it. Because basically, I'd have activated different patterns. This is actually quite scary in marketing terms. Um, if I see that lovely little apple symbol, it activates favorable patterns on my brain, so I view everything else with good patterns. On the other hand, if I see four colored rectangles in a wavy pattern, <laughs> it does the exact opposite. That leads us in marketing to what's called double hit. You send out the first message is to activate the brain to be receptive to the second message. It also means that actually you can't make people rational decision makers. What you've got to do is manage the patterns through which they see the data. That's where human sensor networks come into their own. Now, if you think about this in evolutionary terms, it makes a lot of sense. You know, the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African belt, and when identified lions, look up best practice case studies on how to deal with lions? You know, by that time, the document you'll really need is the manual on the digestive tract of a large carnivore because that's where you'll be located. We evolved to make decisions very quickly based on partial data scans and to adopt the very old joke about two Canadians meeting a bear in the forest run faster than our companion. Yeah, we have pattern recognition intelligences, not information processing machines. So what do we do in organizations? We try and force people to be information processors, which dumbs down their intelligence. There's a very old joke on this. You will find people at BT, with well, one guy at BT Marketing, who's a total and utter idiot, who keeps predicting that computers will exceed human beings in intelligence within a defined time period. It gets him good publicity. He's assuming that human brains work on binary processes, which they don't. You know, amplitude and gap is a part of it. But he may be right, because we're probably planning to meet computers halfway. If we continue to drive people into rigid, process-based, information first decision-making, human beings are as capable of losing intelligence over two or three generations as they are of gaining it. And I would express an extreme concern at the point at this moment. We are developing at the moment a generation of specialists. We're losing generalists. And a collection of specialists is not the same thing as a generalist. When I was at school, and this is you know, back in the 60s, I did physics, pure maths, applied maths, geology, and history as A-level. And it was unusual to do a history with a science combination. But even with that, if we haven't read Shakespeare, we've considered inadequate human beings. Yeah? Now, it's difficult to get my son, who is studying chemistry, to even read a book outside the context of his own discipline. My daughter, who's doing anthropology, gets given a pre-read reading pack at the start of every term rather than having to go and explore and find things serendipitously in the library. And everybody is focused on module by module achievement rather than education. And I say this as a general concern, particularly those of you who deal with systems involving engineering with people. The ability to understand both becomes key. In fact, I think MBA programs should be abolished um, because they're based on cases and they confuse correlation with causation. I'm currently putting one together for one of the universities I'm associated with that we may or may not get through, in which the MBA is nothing but two years of first year courses in anthropology, psychology, <coughs> biology, and the final year is a thesis to apply the knowledge they've gained. Because that gives them a knowledge base to be good managers. Whereas teaching them how some American companies say they were successful actually produces exactly the wrong effect. So, Moving on from that, this is the Kenevin framework. This kind of like takes the complexity theory on a bit. Uh, Kenevin is a Welsh word. Um, anybody speak Welsh? Okay. Um, its literal translation into English is habitat or place. But it don't mean that. Um, the best translation I've seen is in Sinclair Lewis. Basically, it says it's the place of your multiple belongings. It implies a routine in many different, you know, you know, both physical space, spiritual space, family space, tribal space. It's a sense of being a nexus of a flow in time. So it's a very good name for a complexity model. Uh, the reason the English don't have an equivalent for it, by the way, is that you've never had a place of your own. You've only ever stolen other people's. <laughs> and we haven't forgiven you for the 13th century yet, but, you know, that's an old rivalry. So the Canadian framework takes those three domains, but it takes order and it divides it into two. Simple order 
is where the relationship between cause and effect is self-evident to everybody, okay? as a result of which we can apply best practice, and this is the only legitimate domain of that, and our decision model is sense, categorize, respond. We then have complicated order. Sorry, I've gone too far on that. In complicated order, there is a relationship between cause and effect. It does repeat because of the system constraints, but it can only be known through analysis or expertise. So it's not self-evident. So people have to believe in the analysis or believe in the experts to gain the solution. And here we apply good practice. A major mistake people make is to try and force people in a complicated domain to choose one solution. When actually the real experts know there's three or four different roads and they can't quite explain how because they'll know it when they need to know it. A huge amount of human knowledge is only known when we're contextually stimulated to know it. It's not known in abstract. Which is why interviewing people about what they know is one of the most singly stupid things consultants do. And it's a fairly low bar to define stupid things that consultants do, but that's not the work. On the other hand, the complex system, remember the children's party? We probe sense response. We can only know a complex system by interacting with it, which actually means we can't model it. And this is one of the key distinctions between complexity thinking and systems dynamics. Systems dynamics is obsessed with models. To quote Murray Gell-Mann, the only valid model of a human system is the system itself. In complex systems, we have frameworks through which we can perceive the system. We don't have models because that has too, many, too much baggage with it. Yet models work in order, they don't work in complexity. And the trouble is everybody's got obsessed with agent-based models, yet, which are fine for understanding ants and birds flocking behavior, but human beings have intentionality and multiple identities. So you actually haven't got discrete agency because the models break down automatically. And we make decisions based on contextual rules anyway. And of course, we have a chaotic space in which we get novel practice, in complex is always emergent, where we act sense response. And that middle bit, I haven't got time to go into it, is called disorder, which is a state of not knowing which of the domains you're in. Which actually means you make decisions based on what you normally do. You know, bureaucrats always interpret problems of a failure of order, um, because actually that's where they're comfortable. Now, what we're trying to do here is to create boundaries. Human beings don't understand gradients. If you give human beings a gradient, even with two extreme labels, they'll define the system to sit fit where they're comfortable. If you put a boundary in the system, they will behave differently on each side. Boundaries are very important to changing human behavior. Yeah? And one of the ways the Canadian framework is used is to define the space. That's the catastrophic fold, by the way, I talked about earlier in which if you overstructure things, it breaks catastrophically. Yeah, but there's more in the paper elsewhere. We use this in project management. A large part of the project can be put here, a large part can be put there, but the 5% of the project, which is gonna cause the 95% of the grief, is over there. And that's where you use radically different techniques. Techniques such as social network stimulation. What social network stimulation does is it builds networks across silos with people who've never worked together before to solve problems. That's a very simple technique to practice. You can look it up on our website, it's open source. But what it does is it builds network capability in order that the network can find solutions. You have to distribute the solution finding into the network, but you do it in a controlled way. Crews are another example of solving problems in a complex space. In IT terms, you know, what we actually do is we get most of the project out of the way here, the stuff which nobody knows what the hell to do. We have a competition in which small people can form teams and write programs in their own time. And the ones the users want get put into the project, and the prize is they get to write that bit of the project. That's a prize to die for in an IT community. But it allows this co-evolutionary process between technology capabilities and user requirements. But we also use it generally for strategy. 